after these last days, it could be said that we, through story, been looking at the nature of illusion. But it can also be said that we've been invited to dive deep into our psychic cauldron where all the characters, symbols, and archetypes of our own personal psyche, as well as all the sacred symbols, archetypes, and characters of the ages also dwell. Perhaps you remember those films, uh, the Indian Indiana Jones movies, and I believe it was one that was called Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, in which Indiana Jones had to be tested. And one of those tests was that in order not to have his head lopped from his <coughs> shoulders, he had to be humble and get down on his hands and knees. And there were other tests that came along the way until he finally came to his final test. And that was, he was standing on the edge of a great gaping abyss. Across in the distance, he could see an altar on which there sat a <coughs> goblet that to, in symbolic terms, was referred to as the Holy Grail. Now, Indiana Jones knew that he had to go and get that chalice. But his mind, his senses, when he looked into the abyss, he saw flames bursting up. He heard the great roaring sounds. His senses, his feelings were of great fear because his mind told him this was annihilation. But he knew he had to traverse that gaping abyss to attain and reach the shellers, the holy grail. There's a story of three brothers. All of them had a great spirit of adventure in them, so they all decided that they would go on a quest. They would go on a quest to find some great and unusual thing that they could share. And they decided that it would be a period of 10 years and they made a place at which they would meet after that time. So it so happened that the first brother went to the west. And when he did, he came to a great city where there were all kinds of wares on display. But he happened by chance to come across a store that was displaying mirrors. So he went around the store and he looked in each of the mirrors and of course he himself was reflected as well as the background in which it was that he was facing until he came to one particular mirror that was very strange to him because when he looked in it there was no image of himself, but it seemed that he could see into far distant places. 
and every way the mirror turned, another image would be revealed to him. And he thought to himself, this was a very special thing that he could take to his brother. So he bargained with the storekeeper, and they arrived on a prize, and the brother took his mirror with him. The second brother went to the east, and he found himself in a bazaar. And in looking around at all the stalls, he came across a stall that was displaying Persian rugs, a great pile of them of all different styles and colors and designs. But when he looked, he saw at the bottom of the pile, one of the rugs seemed to be moving. And he asked the storekeeper, well, what did that mean? And the storekeeper whispered to him, well, in fact, this is a magic carpet and it will take you wherever it is that you want to go. So, of course, the second son bargained <coughs> heavily and was able to purchase this magic carpet to take back to show his brothers. But uh, his <coughs> third brother <coughs> went south and there he found himself in a great forest of trees and it seemed that all of the trees were bearing fruit. Of course he ate his fill but then he saw one tree that was covered in leaves and did not seem to have any fruit. But when he came close to the tree, he saw that up in its branches there was one ripe pomegranate. He thought to himself, why is this tree only bearing one fruit when all the other trees have an abundance? But he raised his hand and it seemed that the fruit dropped out into his hands without him even trying to pluck it. And it was perfect, a beautiful round fruit with the star of King Suleiman nestled in its top. But then to his great surprise, another fruit appeared in the tree in the place that one had fallen into his hand. So he took the fruit, he thought to himself, this is obviously a most special fruit. So he took this fruit as that which he was going to go to bring to show to his brothers. So the time passed and they eventually came back to their meeting place. And the first brother showed his mirror. Turning in any direction, they could see in far distant places. The second with his magic carpet, and the third with his pomegranate. But as they were turning the mirror around, all of a sudden an image of a place where the people in the streets were all walking around sadly, forlorn, long faces. And when they peered more closely and shifted the mirror slightly, there was revealed a maiden in a palace, obviously a princess, lying in earth, pale and worn. Around her stood those who were concerned, thinking that there was nothing that they could do to bring her back to seeming life and vitality again. So the second brother said, let us go there on my magic carpet. So they did, and they arrived at the 
propellers. But then, suddenly, the third brother had a thought. Give the pomegranate to the princess. And so, it was said to the king, could I try to save the princess's life? And so, he was taken into the presence. But then, he went over to her bed and very gently, kernel by kernel, he fed the pieces of the pomegranate to the princess and with each taste of each kernel, she came back to life until she was completely restored. So, of course, the king had already decreed that whoever saved her life would be wedded to her. But then all the three brothers claimed her hand. The first one said, if we had not looked in the magic mirror, we would not have found her. The second said, if we did not have my magic carpet, we would not have been able to go there. And the third, of course, said, without my pomegranate, she would not have been restored to life. So this was a great dilemma that the king could not solve. So he asked the princess, who will be your husband? And she said, let me ask them a question. So to the first she said, where is your magic mirror? And he said, it is here. I have it still. And to the second she asked, where is your magic carpet? And he said, it is here. I have it. And to the third she asked, and where is the pomegranate? And he said, oh, princess, it was given to you. It is no more. The princess said, I will marry the third brother because why did the princess choose the third brother because the other two were holding on to what they had discovered that would get them through. But the third gave his away to her, which then that's like the male giving to the female and then they join them or something like that. Yes. And if we take this to a sublime <coughs> spiritual level, so called, it's like giving without attachment, just for the sake of whatever just just comes from inside you, and you know, worry whatever is is good or bad or you. Something. Absolutely. If you put these two things together, they make an amazing equation. But there's a saying, one of my very favorite sayings that you've probably heard throughout these years. God is
is a jealous God. He wants all of your heart. What does it mean for us? He's willing to give everything up. Exactly. Now what is this story about the three brothers? How does it bring together this quest, if you can call it, the inquiry into the nature of the absence of illusion? And this cauldron spoken of, this mandala, this psychic crucible, as we go along and we get just a like um, another opening into that in, into the power within us so once we get like once he got his mirror then and some people will see something in life at that stage and then they'll just stay there with the carpet and the mirror, but he just moved on. Mm -hmm. 